welcome everyone. We'd like to uh, thank you for coming to the webinar sponsored by the California Climate Change Task Force. April Okenda will be presenting some simple actions we can take to reduce emissions. First, a couple of points on logistics. If you have questions, you need to just type those in the question box. And to do that, you will see at the top of your screen, um, just one second, at the top of your screen, you'll see a little red or orange box with an arrow in it. If you click on that, you'll come to an enlarged version of your dashboard. Questions down below, you can expand it. Type the question in the lower box and send. So anytime in the in the webinar, you're welcome to send in a question and we'll answer them at the end. So today we're delighted to have um, our speaker, April Okenda, who is a member of the Climate Change Task Force and an educator in the CSU system and has been for nine years. Uh, she currently lectures in English and business at CSU Stanislaus. She is very active in um, community and in uh, climate change actions. So we welcome you, um, April, and we will go to you. Um, just one second, we'll send you the control and you can take it away. Great. Thank you, Diz, and thank to, thanks to all of you who are listening and for taking an interest in this uh, really important issue. I'm not sure, um, Diz, is that okay how it's showing up on, on your side? I have a screen still active. Is that better? It's fine. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'll just start by explaining um, what inspired me to do this webinar. Um, I read an article in the New York Times a while back um, called How to Reduce Your Carbon F Footprint by Livia Albeck Ripka. Um, and I was really inspired by the article because it offered some simple actions that any person could take to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, but what I wasn't thrilled about was the not so easy access to this article. Um, my friend had recommended it to me, and as I Googled it, it took me a really long time to find it. And then when he finally sent me the link, um, you had to have a subscription to the New York Times. And so I didn't, it wasn't something that I could pass along easily to some friends and family. So I decided to um, take the, the actions that they listed there and expand upon them a little bit and also use some of the research that I've done along the way um, on these topics to create this, um, this uh, PowerPoint and, and webinar that we're sharing with you today. Um, and I know that this can be a topic that's incredibly uh, daunting and something that feels larger than our control. And, and so what I liked about these steps is that they're practical, they're things that we can start working on now, and it really is um, action that you can take to, to reduce emissions. All right, so let's see here. Uh, the first thing that you should do is to um, calculate your own carbon footprint. So uh, your carbon footprint is essentially the total amount of green, uh, greenhouse gas emissions that come from your way of life. Um, there are several things that you'll want to have um, before you do this. So thinking about how often you travel and by what means. Um, the kind of gas that you use and then um, assessing the energy usage in your own home. Uh, you'll want to know about how much you spend on your shopping and then the composition of the diet, what you consume. And this carbon footprint is really just a way to get a sense of, um, of how you're doing, where there are areas in, in your life where there's room for improvement. And then um, when you finish your, your assessment, it'll give you a number and then also some ways that you can take actions once you complete the survey. So I highly recommend starting here just so that you have a, a broad baseline um, that you can, you can use as you know, you're going forward where you can focus your attention. So the um, issue of climate change, as I said, it can feel incredibly daunting. It's just such a big 
issue um, that I often feel powerless um, in terms of what I can do about it. Um, and I hear people who echo that same feeling of helplessness. Um, we see that, you know, we, we take these little steps or maybe they're big steps to change our habits. And then we look over at, you know, our neighbor and perhaps they're not as conscientious um, or not making as much effort. And so it seems like it all just kind of balances out. Um, but the um, I felt very empowered by what is the uh, rise of interest in at the individual level. Um, and 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 how um, inspired people are to take action on this. So these are the five steps listed here: um, travel, meals, home consumption, and advocacy. And and we'll look at each one, um, and then obviously have time for questions at the end as well. All right, let's see. Uh, the first one: travel. Uh, emissions from cars um, and other forms of transportation, this is a top contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So this is the number one area where you can start to look at your life and see how you can make a difference and cut back um, on your car travel. I know living in California, it can make it difficult to uh, change your relationship with your car, um, but just see this as an opportunity to look at how you can reduce the time spent in your car. Um, you can take uh, public transportation as much as you can, um, or even better, you could consider walking if it's close enough or riding your bike um, to your destination. And, and not only is this better for the planet, but it's an opportunity to get some exercise, which is good for all of us. Um, so travel. And going um, on from there, when you do have to drive, because for many of us, um, public transportation or walking or riding a bike, that's not always a realistic option. So when you do have to be in your car, these are some things that you can um, be conscientious about. So how much you are pressing down on your gas pedal and your brakes, that, um, that will use up more gasoline, um, which is greater emissions. And so if you can go a little gentle there. That's, um, that's something that you can do anytime that you're in the car. Um, also, regular maintenance and service of your car, it um, will operate at a higher efficiency, and so it will cut down on the amount of gas that you have to use to run your car. Um, maintaining your optimal tire pressure. So just checking your tires on a regular basis. Um, if your tires are low, it can affect the amount of gas that you use as you drive. Uh, cutting down on your air conditioner, especially as we're going into these summer months, this is one that is a little more challenging. So just seeing, um, you know, if you can roll down your windows or maybe uh, take off a few garments so that you can avoid using your air conditioner. Um, you want to avoid prolonged city driving. Again, that stop and start that we talked about with the gas pedal and brakes, that's going to use up more gas. So um, as much as you can avoid that inner city driving, the better. And then when you are on uh, long stretches of freeway or interstate, um, use your tr cruise control. This is going to help uh, reduce the fluctuations in your speed. And so you'll maintain uh, a more controlled um, cruising level. And then uh, traveling light, you want to avoid weighing down your car. It, um, it uses up more gasoline. And then carpooling is another great option. Bring a friend. Um, not only will you uh, have some company along your drive, but it also means that you get to split the emissions of that trip with the person who's in your car. So added bonus there. I am not advocating buying a new car. Um, Diz and I were actually having this conversation yesterday that there is uh, other, there are other considerations to take into account, like the product the cost of productivity for the car. So um, maybe Diz, you can share more about that as we wrap up. But um, something to think about if you are in a position, if it is time to buy a new car, these are some things that you want to consider as a consumer. Um, looking, if you're looking for uh, electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles, something you want to take into account is the fuel efficiency. Um, and there's a great website called fueleconomy.gov that you can check out there. And I'm happy to um, go over any of these links or supply them afterward. Um, determine where you'll be able to charge your car, not only um, at your own residence, but also if you have um, regular commutes that you do, looking at where the charging stations are along that route. Uh, a great website for that is climatefriendlycars.climatecentral.org. 
Uh, the cost of production. So not only do you need to consider the emissions from this car, but the emissions that it took to produce this car. Um, that goes into your carbon for footprint. So uh, a tool that you can use there is uh, carboncounter.com. And then the last one you can check, um, there's an organization called Smartway. And if, a sm uh, if you're getting a Smartway vehicle, it'll give you more information about uh, the emissions of this car. And you can check that out at uh, epa.gov slash green vehicles. And another thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about buying a new car is that uh, cars with lower emissions, they often cost less to operate. So long term, you're also saving money. fly less. So it's not just our time in the car. Unfortunately, we also need to be mindful of how often we are in the air. Um, obviously, these larger vehicles use uh, more, uh, more gas and so greater emissions. Um, Especially going in again to the summer months, this is a prime time for traveling and vacationing. So something to think about if you already have your travel set to offset your flight time. Um, these are two uh, suggestions here, Atmosphere and TerraPass, and they can help you calculate the uh, length of your flight and then how much emissions came as a result of that flight. And so you can offset there and they have a lot of charitable organizations where they send that money. Um, but yeah, if you think about if there is a, an opportunity to drive somewhere rather than fly or really assessing whether or not the travel is necessary in the first place. Moving on to number two here for meals. This is a big one, and this is the second biggest way that you can lower your emissions. Um, food is something that we make choices about on a daily basis. And so the goal here is to think about how we can make more intentional choices about what we put on our plate. The first one, and this again is, is really big, um, it's really looking at how much eat, uh, meat that you're eating. Um, there is a great podcast that I just, uh, a, an interview on the Ezra Klein show. It's a podcast and he interviews Melanie Joy. Um, her latest book is called Beyond Beliefs. And she investigates uh, the way that eating meat has become normalized in our culture. And um, I, I would say it's probably a little bit radical in terms of what she is promoting, but she did her doctoral dissertation on, um, on this issue. And so she shares a lot of her findings in terms of the effects on the environment and also, um, also on uh, emissions, of course. And so I would recommend maybe listening to that podcast, maybe picking up her book. There are also a a lot of great documentaries that you can watch for more information on why eating meat is such a large contributor to your carbon footprint, um, especially when it comes to animals like cows um, and, and the rising levels of methane that they put into the atmosphere. So cutting back, um, and this is one, I know this is really difficult. In fact, some of you are probably, you know, cringing as you're sitting listening to me say this because meat is an integral part of your diet. And just like anything, I always tell my students, this. You know, transformation is not something that happens overnight. It takes baby steps. And none of us came out of the womb walking. We had to learn to, you know, sit up and then scoot and crawl and walk. And, and here we are, um, you know, running and dancing and doing all sorts of other things. So with this one, I would say um, you don't have to go vegan in order to do this today. Um, it's something that you can just start to be more mindful about. So think next time you order a salad, um, maybe avoid getting the grilled chicken added to it. Um, cutting back here and there, again, these little steps that all put together add up to a big impact. Uh, second one, eating local. So again, when you're assessing your carbon footprint, you also have to account for the carbon footprint of the travel time for your food. So if you're buying food that isn't locally sourced, the way that it was transported to the place where you're buying it is something to take into consideration. Um, so again, here, this is a, a case where uh, maybe go to your uh, local farmer's market the next time that um, it's happening and buy your produce and you know, your vegetables and, and some farmers markets have a really robust um, selection. So you may be able to get um, more uh, in terms of what you're used to getting at the grocery store at the farmers market. 
Eating organic. This is one that uh, kind of is a wash, but I still um, wanted to include it because there are other health benefits in terms of what you're putting into your body. Um, but regarding the production of organic foods, while it does use less energy than non-organic farming methods, um, it often uses more land. So this one ends up being kind of a toss up. But um, again, I think we want to be promoting uh, healthy ways of farming, sustainable ways of farming. And so eating organic is a way to, uh, to put your consumer dollars into that more ethical treatment of the land and then, um, and then thinking about how we can improve on that from here. Uh, this next one, waste less. This is one that's particularly concerning for Americans. So according to the New York Times article that I referenced earlier, um, she writes that um, Americans waste around 40% of the food they buy. So 40% is a lot. Something to think about as you're looking at ways that you can cut back on your waste and, and also save money in the process because you won't be throwing away the things that you're buying. Um, looking at your fridge and pantry and making sure that your food is organized, um, having a sense of the inventory and making sure that you're not doubling up on things that you already have when you go to the grocery store. Creating a grocery list is another way to avoid um, buying things that you don't need. And then also it's a great way to see uh, you know, what food is about to go back and prioritize eating that. Another thing to be careful about is buying in bulk, especially with you know Costco and, and stores like that. We want to save money, of course, but um, the consideration you should also have is is it going to uh, will it will you eat it before it goes bad? How long will its shelf life be um, and, and can you eat it in that time? You also want to calculate when cooking. Make sure that you're not overcooking or that you're not cooking uh, too much food more than what you or the people eating with you can eat in one sitting. And if you do have leftovers, then you'll want to make sure that you um, have time in the coming days to eat that food before it goes bad. And if that isn't possible, if you're going out of town, then consider putting it in the freezer so that you can eat it at another time. And then finally, um, when you go out to eat, looking at what's on your plate and if there's anything left over, asking to have it wrapped up so that you can take it home and eat it there. And then the last one here, the last bullet point is, what are you eating on and with? Um, and I have to say, I see this one happening all over the place where we are we are eating on disposable plates, even when we're going out to eat, um, the way that the food is packaged. Um, this is something I've talked to my local league about in terms of whenever we have meetings and people want to share food. And so this is something where um, it's not as obvious, but you want to be mindful about the disposable uh, utensils and plateware that you're using as you eat. So as much as you can, if you do have to use disposable, you wanna just make sure that it's either compostable or biodegradable. Um, if you're concerned living in California about the water that it takes to wash dishes, um, the general rule of thumb is that if you're hand washing or if you're using an energy efficient dishwasher, then it's still more environmentally friendly than using disposable eatware. Um, and then if, if uh, those times again when you're out at a restaurant and you've taken your food to go consider reusing those containers so just give them a rinse and then reuse especially if they're plastic they'll hold up for quite a bit of time and most of all you want to avoid plastic water bottles um, a lot of places now are um, using hydration stations at their facilities i know here in um, hayward we've been putting into our schools hydration stations to um, help the students refill you know stay hydrated during the day but not with having to bring several plastic water bottles to do so so as much as you can um, switch over make it a habit to just grab your reusable water bottle and then trust that you'll be able to refill it uh, along the way and throughout your day all right So the next thing you want to look at, and this is this is a big one, and of course I'm going to say again here that this is something to do in stages. Um, it costs this costs money and investment. Um, so do this over time, but just have it on your radar in terms of how to how to look at your home and and move toward a more energy efficient home. 
you want to um, first take a look at your, your heat, your lights, and your appliances. Not only will this help to save energy, but it's also, again, going to cut back on costs. So your heat, check to make sure your heat's as low as possible. Maybe consider throwing on a sweater instead of turning on the heater when those winter months come around. You also, and this is true for summer, keeping your blinds and your curtains closed to regulate the temperature that's inside. So once you have it cooled down, um, you know, keep that cool air in. Um, also your water heaters, uh, you wanna monitor the heat there. So the um, recommendation is 120 degrees Fahrenheit. You wanna check your appliances and your lights to make sure that they're either switched off or even unplugged when they're not in use so that you're not wasting energy. Um, lights, you also want to make sure that you're replacing them as needed and um, and go for LED lights as often as possible. I don't recommend buying new appliances. Wait for the ones that you have to wear down. You don't want to um, contribute um, unnecessary waste. But when it is time to um, buy a new appliance, look for that Energy Star symbol, and that'll let you know that um, it's energy efficient. Uh, this is one that I didn't really think about before, but ditching your desktop for a laptop. Uh, laptops take less energy to charge and then to run once they're on. Avoid setting your fridge and freezer to temperatures lower than necessary. And this includes the extra refrigerators, maybe the ones out in the garage. Um, you might consider getting rid of that fridge that's out in the garage, really assessing whether or not you need it. Um, and then um, checking your old refrigerators if you have old ones and maybe switching to a more energy efficient one when the time comes. And then of course, um, using renewable forms of energy as much as possible for um, you know lighting and, and heat and things like that. Recycling. You want to be conscientious about what you recycle. And so one of the first things you can look at is even in your own home, do you have a recycle bin? Um, do you have a, a bin that you can put compost in? So starting in your home and looking at looking at how you can be more conscientious as you're getting rid of the waste that you have. You want to make sure that you're putting things in the right bin. Um, so at the bottom of plastic containers, you'll see a little triangle. And within that triangle is a number. And that will let you know whether or not that, uh, that plastic bottle, whatever it is, can be recycled. Um, you want to make sure that you're not, if you are putting plastic into a bin, make sure that if it had food in it, that it's rinsed out, that you've fully emptied that container before putting it into the recycle bin. Um, and then be careful with non-recyclables. Don't put things that don't belong in there um, in the recycle bins. Uh, let's see, recycling paper. This is one that a lot of people aren't aware of, um, and you can recycle paper. It can go in your recycle bin, so be sure that you're recycling your paper. And pause before you toss. The goal is to reduce waste, as we think back to a few slides ago, right? Um, cutting back on, on waste. And so before you toss something, just really assess whether or not this item can be repaired um, or whether it can be reused. I mean, this goes even down to something like socks. If you have a hole in your sock, then consider um, sewing it and repairing it rather than just throwing it away. So being more thoughtful about that. Uh, let's see, electronics, um, there are several places where you can donate your electronics that are still in working condition. Um, some electronics stores take them back and then try to recycle, uh, or sorry, this is for uh, recycle what's broken. You can take broken uh, electronics to uh, many electronics stores. So just check your area and see um, where that place is for you. You can recycle your dry cell batteries um, at any local municipality. And same for your uh, car batteries to a mun municipality or your local car dealer. And this is the last one here on home. You want to check your installation. Make sure that everything is properly sealed. And um, this is going to, again, help to regulate the temperature indoors, both in terms of heat and cooling. So. Um, Places where you would likely have air escaping out would be the attic, the windows, the doors, um, anywhere where you can tell that heat um, or cool air could leak through. 
Um, you can also check the energy efficiency ratings for all of the exit areas of your house um, and consider moving to more modern versions. And again, this is over a, a period of time. This isn't something, you know, perhaps that you can do tomorrow, um, but spacing out these um, upgrades in your home. There are also ways to redirect sunlight through um, a cool roof so that your home stays cooler. The sunlight isn't um, creating heat for your home. Another way to keep your house cool is to plant uh, some trees around um, the area for additional shade. And then a lot of areas have incentives, things like tax credits and rebates for making these repairs and improvements to your home. So check that out for your local area to help cut back on some of the costs that this will incur. All right, the fourth area that we're going to look at is consumption. Are you a mindful consumer? Uh, there is a great documentary called The True Cost about uh, specifically looking at the Western world, but the way that we have a, a relationship with disposable attire. So you want to look at the things that you're buying, see if they have a fair trade symbol or something comparable to that um, on their logo. Um, so that you're buying things that are ethically made. You also want to become a thrift store junkie. So um, the bottom one there says the thrift store contributor. I'll talk about both those together. So um, go through your closet and rather than throwing things away, um, consider donating them to your local thrift store um, and consider purchasing things at your local thrift store. So it's not only that you aren't uh, creating a demand by buying new clothing, but you're also recycling and reusing things that are already in existence. So um, uh, double bang for your buck there and some vintage stores or antique shops, anything like that where you're doing secondhand shopping. Um, another question to ask yourself is, how many times will I wear this? Uh, so one of the things that the documentary, The True Cost, talked about was what uh, this phenomenon called fast fashion. And, and this is where um, people will go into a store and there's a one-time occasion and they will buy something for that um, and really only wear it one time and know that they'll probably get rid of it after. So as you purchase things, and this isn't just um, limited to clothing, but you could think about, about this in terms of anything that you use or bring into your home. How often are you going to wear it? How often are you going to use it? Um, if you can see this being part of your life for years down the road, then it's probably okay to buy it. Another thing you want to think about is the, um, the fabric that the, the garment is made with. Same is true for um, like mattresses or other pieces of furniture. You want to assess the carbon footprint in terms of emissions to create or produce that fabric. So you, leaning toward... Um, Leaning toward um, wool over in, uh, synthetics is a good example. You want to go for, for wool. Um, a few more things on the thrift store contributions. Um, animal shelters will take old sheets and towels. So that's another place where you can donate um, some of your, your household items. And then as you're out in the world and purchasing things. Um, be a, a sustainable shopper that way. So bring your reusable bag into the grocery store rather than um, taking a plastic or paper bag, something that um, they've given you. Also, skip the packaging. Um, I, I always am, am looking at when I order something from a food counter and the packaging that they're giving it to me. And so if you have a chance to sit and actually eat your meal as opposed to taking it to go. That's a way to cut down on packaging. Also just looking, um, I mean, if you go into Trader Joe's and you look at the packaging there, there's all this unnecessary plastic and, and things around this apparatus around the product itself. So looking at that and seeing if you can choose an option that doesn't require so much packaging or maybe instead of taking um, five napkins, maybe just take one napkin. So looking at packaging is another um, great way to cut back on on waste and also to not uh, overuse, use more than what's actually needed. Quality over quantity. You want to take time to invest money in the things that are high quality that you will have for a long time rather than maybe uh, buying something because it's a little bit cheaper but that you know is more likely to break in the future. 
And then uh, things uh, again here where if you if you are in a, in a situation where you need to buy or have things with packaging or aren't able to use reusable bags, you forgot them in your car or whatever, um, consider carbon offsets as a way to um, mitigate some of that. Low, keep your keep your carbon footprint as low as possible. And then this is where the league comes in, um, advocacy. This is number five. Make your voice heard. So um, the league does a lot about education, and this is a place where you can take some of the information you've learned today and over some of the other webinars that um, the Climate Change Task Force has hosted. Take that information that you now have and bring it to your local league. Share it with the people in your life. It's up to all of us to not only educate ourselves, but then take what we've learned, implement it in our lives, and share it with the people around us to inspire them to to be smarter consumers and to lower their carbon footprint. Um, another thing you can do is um, advocate. Find out what climate action groups are in your area. Um, you can look um, on the Climate Change Task Force on our website. We have a few um, organizations listed there. You can look to your local league. If you have a climate group already um, in place, I highly recommend getting involved with them. If you don't have one, then you might consider chairing up um, this, this position yourself, maybe adding something to your local league's program related to uh, climate uh, advocacy and see what you can do in your local area to get involved and, and to make sure that you're a voice in your community on this issue. Um, of course, you all know contacting your local representatives, this is something that the League does really well. Um, and uh, the task force, we follow legislation that's moving through uh, through the Senate and the Assembly in California. And so we do our best to um, let you know when there is something that you can take action on. Um, and of course, we welcome if you know about something that's moving through please feel free to contact us to make sure that we know about it. And then last but not least, voting. Voting on the policies that will protect the environment. This is the number one way that you can make your voice heard. And uh, again, encouraging others to be educated about, about the bills and the ways that um, voting can make a huge difference on this topic. So that brings me to the end. Are there any questions? Thank you, April. That was uh, enjoyable as well as informative. And I'm struck by how much money a person can save by doing some of the um, some of the actions that you talked about. So um, you as when we see questions from you all, we'd be happy to uh, talk to you about anything that's considered that you want us to consider or discuss. <clears throat> One thing you mentioned, April, was the uh, car. If you, you Getting an electric vehicle in a place where electricity is renewable, so not in a coal-fired plant area, but if you have solar on your house, for example, and can charge your car, that's a great idea. But you also mentioned that the production of a car uses a huge amount of energy, as does the recycling of a car. And so um, there's a point after which you should really just use the car you have. And you made that point very well, I thought. <clears throat> so, it, it, pardon me, are there any questions? <coughs> so, not, so none appearing. Sorry about my cough. Um, we'll call it a close. Just one second. <coughs> um, this is your hor Horse host with <laughs> Swift. Um, I'd like to invite you to the next climate change event. The um, <clears throat> U.S. Price on Carbon Steering Team is hosting a caucus at the National Convention talking about how to advocate for carbon pricing and a clarification on how to partner with other organizations on carbon pricing like Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, we'd be delighted if you could come to the convention in the caucus, but should you miss it, we're going to do a webinar on that on July 26. So thank you for your attention and uh, your patience with my croaky voice.
And uh, we will send you a, no a notice when this is a recording is available, as well as a list of the links that April referred to. So you can get online and see those things. So thank you all very much. Uh, April, do you have anything to close? Uh, no, thank you so much for your time. Okay, bye for now. Bye.